heaped tablespoon of baking soda, slathered on and scrubbed around from head to toe on your wet skin is cleansing and stimulating. Mm. <laughs> That's what it says here. This is Jay. Rinse well, restore the skin's natural slight acidity with a spasm of a uh, splash of cider vinegar and you'll feel sleek as ever. A fresh sprig of rosemary on your favourite <laughs> whole spice or herb and an attractive acrylic drink bottle of vinegar. Both can be bought at bulk at farm supply shops. Chris, I'm not quite sure if you're going to go down that route tonight. <laughs> I think Chris Michelle. had a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. No, protect um, soap for me, thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Michelle Langston, Chris Finnison, I really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. I'm Wallace, Wallace Chapman back tomorrow. <laughs> 345. <laughs> 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 this is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Now, Heidi Akine, the highly choreographed diplomatic dance with two foreign ministers desperately dodging each other's toes as they navigate the dragon in the room. Nanaya Mahuta is live. A restaurant faces a David and Goliath battle as it backs away from its MIQ neighbourhood. Could a proposed golf course redevelopment hack 100k a piece off neighbouring houses? The cops, the cash and the car, who pinched the money from a vehicle impounded by police? While New Zealand's still deciding exactly what role GPs will play in our vaccine rollout, we go inside a Sydney clinic rationing 400 jabs a week and last chance to see an elephant in Aotearoa. The final two pack their trunks for Australia. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora kōsū sana lei ātawa tēnei. Australia and New Zealand's foreign ministers have plastered on smiles during their first face-to-face meeting, despite an assortment of festering trans-Tasman tensions. Maurice Payne has made quick use of the new two-way travel bubble, sitting down with her counterpart Nanaia Mahuta in Wellington today. The two discussed an array of topics, including COVID-19, 501 deportees and the Suheira Aden case. Australia prompted fury from Jacinda Ardern earlier this year after it stripped the suspected ISIS sympathiser of her citizenship because of uh, leaving New Zealand to pick up the pieces. Speaking at a media conference this afternoon, Ms Payne stressed that Australia took New Zealand's concerns very seriously. She said the pair had constructive discussions about Aden but had nothing to announce. I want to say very clearly that regardless of the steps uh, that have been taken in this case to date, uh, both New Zealand and Australia acknowledge that it now does have a number of complexities. Uh, We are working through those issues uh, in the spirit of our bilateral relationship, uh, particularly in relation to children. Maurice Payne says the two countries will continue to work together. The owners of an Auckland restaurant on the ground floor of an MIQ facility say it was forced to close because diners were scared off by potential COVID-19 cases. The restaurant, called Grasshopper, kept operating for just two months more last year, separated from the rest of the Stamford Plaza with fences. The Auckland couple who ran it say they wanted a say in the hotel's decision to accept returnees. One of them, Edward Viterbo, says the government should have consulted businesses surrounding hotels before it approved them for use as MIQ facilities. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment says hotels talk to stakeholders before becoming an MIQ facility. A study of blood samples has revealed eight cases of COVID-19 that went previously undetected in the community. Auckland University's Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences tested nearly 10,000 samples of blood donations from New Zealanders to see if they had antibodies for the virus. Associate Professor Dr Nikki Morland says from the samples of 18 people tested, 18 people tested positive for a historical COVID-19 infection. We were able to back match six of those to people who had already previously been confirmed as being infected. And another four had extensive travel in 2020 to places that have really high risk of COVID infection. So it's most likely that they were infected overseas. So that left eight people were previously undiagnosed. Dr Morland says the eight cases were spread through seven DHBs and show a low level of undetected community transmission.
Wellington bus drivers who go on strike tomorrow will then be locked out indefinitely. The union and the company have been in negotiations for weeks over a new collective agreement. This morning, the Tramways Union gave notice bus drivers working for operator NZ Bus will go on strike from tomorrow morning until Saturday. But NZ Bus has now told the union that following the end of the strike, the 100 drivers involved will be locked out. The lockout will be extended until the union agrees to the collective agreement. University annual reports show a huge bill for redundancies at the University of Auckland last year. They also show a big drop in income from foreign students across the sector. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. Five of the eight universities have published their 2020 annual reports and the impact of the pandemic is strong. Four, Auckland, Massey, Victoria and Canterbury reported deficits for their core operations. Auckland spent $44 million on redundancies in preparation for an expected shortage of foreign students over the next few years. Despite the loss of international students, Auckland, Canterbury and AUT received more money from fees last year than in 2019, thanks to an increase in domestic enrolments. Victoria and Massey reported less fees income. Call John Garrett's in TNA. It's four minutes past five. Football Ferns coach Tom Simani is refusing to shy away from the challenge of drawing the toughest pull for the Tokyo Olympics. The New Zealand women's side have been drawn against world number one USA, the Rio 2016 silver medalists Sweden and trans-Tasman rivals Australia. Making their task even tougher is the fact the full squad won't get together before the tournament. Simani, though, says the Olympics will provide his players with the chance to prove themselves great gauge for us to see where our game is actually at in comparison to the best teams in the world. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough to be going to the Olympics and then fortunate enough to play, you know, the, the number one team in the world and two other teams that are higher in top ten. The men's team has been grouped with South Korea, Honduras and Romania. Days after winning her first tournament in three years, golfer Lydia Ko has endured a horror opening round in the latest LPGA event in California. Last week, she won the LPGA, LPGA event in Hawaii, but on the LA Open today, Ko carded a seven over par first round of 79 to be 14 shots off the lead. The New Zealand team will be playing catch-up in this weekend's opening round of Sale GP in Bermuda, but skipper Peter Burling doesn't think it'll hurt their chances too much. They only only managed to get their foiling catamaran on the water for the first time yesterday while strong winds prevented any sailing today. They have been able to borrow rivals' boats for practice earlier in the week. That's the news. A broken health system. The best part of the whole proposal is minimising their input into health by the Ministry of Incompetence. Rebuilding black rights in America. It seems as though the Republicans don't care about the problems of the poor and the Democrats give us crumbs off the table. And a burlesque legacy. Tempest really did always do it her way. She had said that when she goes out, she hopes that that's plain. Don't you know I did it my way? Doing it our way. Morning Report, weekdays from 6 on air and online. Now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight tomorrow. Northland to Taranaki, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Taumaranui and Taupo. Mostly fine tonight, isolated showers in the eastern Bay of Plenty ranges. Rain developing tomorrow afternoon and evening with possible thunderstorms in the north and west. For the remainder of the North Island, fine, but cloudy periods for Carpety Coast and Wellington where rain develops tomorrow night. Nelson and Marlborough, fine, however rain with heavy falls developing tomorrow evening. Buller, Westland and Fiordland, fine and Buller. Rain developing elsewhere tonight. Widespread rain tomorrow with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms. Canterbury and North Otago, fine weather, some high cloud tomorrow. For the remainder of Otago and Southland, fine spells tonight. Occasional rain in the west tomorrow with a few showers spreading further east in the evening. And Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. RNC National, it's seven minutes past five. Thanks, Susana. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai ki checkpoint e tēnei rā. Ko Lisa Owen taku ingwa. It was a delicate dance as New Zealand and Australia's foreign ministers fielded media questions following their first face-to-face meeting since COVID. The pair collectively described the relationship between the two countries as very special, warm and close, despite in recent times being at odds over a number of issues. Senator Maurice Payne and the Naya Mahuta discussed everything from so 
so-called 501 deportees being sent back to New Zealand and the fate of mother of two, Sahara Aden, who is suspected of having links to ISIS and is currently in Turkey. Australia has cancelled her citizenship, leaving New Zealand responsible for her. And then there's the dragon in the room, China. Foreign Minister Nanaya Mahuta joins me now. Kia ora, Minister. Tēnā koe, kia ora. So I watched your press conference this afternoon. It was terribly choreographed. Both of you appeared to be reading from pre-prepared answers. Why so cautious? Not cautious at all. It signalled the extent of the range of issues that we covered. It was a very uh, warm meeting. We discussed some difficult issues, but we were able to ensure that the breadth and depth of the issues we wanted to to discuss in our first face-to-face meeting could be covered. So, talked about Five Eyes? Yes, we did. And really, I I reiterated, as I did in the press conference, uh, to be clear that I signalled that, you know, the remit for the Five Eyes arrangements are based on security and intelligence uh, arrangements. And I didn't think that it was necessary to invoke Five Eyes all the time on every issue, such as issues such as human rights. And that, that was expressed in the uh, uh, in the meeting and again to journalists afterwards. So, had you spoken to Maurice Payne about your views on that prior to today? What we had spoken about was where we could agree uh, together, where it was uh, in, in our interest and reflected uh, the opportunity to express very strongly between Australia and New Zealand our position on Hong Kong, our position on Xinjiang, and you would have seen that in the two declarations that we did make together. And that's really an exercise of how we work together on the things that we can agree on. But Minister, what I'm trying to establish is did you or have you, prior to making your comments earlier this week, discussed directly with Maurice Payne your concerns around the remit of Five Eyes seemingly expanding to making joint statements on human rights and democracy issues? Well, since coming into office, we've had a number of engagements and interactions about human rights issues in particular. And again, as we make decisions about whether or not to join uh, certain statements, that those discussions inevitably uh, happen. But can I say this? We were absolutely unequivocal on Hong Kong and Xinjiang that the strongest position that we could take was a joint declaration and we made that commitment as Australia and New Zealand on those issues. Well, let me put it another way. The Australian media is reporting that you blindsided Australia with your comments this week. Did you? Did they have any pre-warning about what you were going to say in your speech? Yeah, look, that's that's the media reporting what they uh, want to see, and, uh, and many of them didn't actually read my speech, uh, so I'm not going to put too much stock into that. I'm more uh, focused on the conversation we did have and the clarity we do have with no, uh, one another since meeting. Can I just get a yes or no on this, Minister? Did you Did you give them a heads up about the contents of your speech? Uh, no, and that's not always the case on any foreign minister's speech that you. So they were blindsided up. by your comments about no, not at all, the, not at all, five not eyes. At all. In fact, not at all. Uh, Senator Payne has read my speech, and she saw what I, uh, she heard and saw what I was uh, delivering in terms of a message. Uh, it's not blindsided. Not every foreign minister on every speech uh, gives a heads up on uh, in terms of what they're saying. But it just doesn't work that way. Can can you pick and choose what you're in Five Eyes for? Five Eyes is a security and intelligence relationship, and we're very comfortable with that arrangement. Whether or not it needs to be invoked uh, for every issue, every time, is another a whole other situation. And as I say, on the issues of Hong Kong and Xinjiang, Australia and New Zealand agreed to do a joint declaration. But that remit has evolved over time, has it not? Because we have been part of joint statements. So, in essence, you have accepted that there are some times when there should be joint statements. So it's not just about um, surveillance and security. It's about shared views on democracy and human rights and shared values. So can we pick and choose what we're in for and what we're out for with Five Eyes? We have over time joined certain Five Eyes statements and I can say that generally in the media they perceive every time uh, the five countries who are 
partners in, in the Five Eyes group make a comment, they attribute it all the time to Five Eyes, and that's actually not the situation. And what I'm saying is I'm very clear since becoming Minister of Foreign Affairs that that's a security and intelligence alliance. And that so do you doesn't see have that alliance every time. Minister, do you see that alliance, and does New Zealand see that alliance differently to the four other members? Well, let's be very clear. Don't put words in my mouth. It's a very important relationship. It's a question, we Minister. Respect, we respect that particular arrangement for those for the purpose for which it was established. So is your view of what Five Eyes is different to the other four members? No, it's the same. It's a security and intelligence set of arrangements, and that's an important framework that we contribute to and also get some value from. How secure is New Zealand's membership of this alliance? I, I think it's it's very secure. I've not heard anything that will fracture uh, the current operation of the Five Eyes Alliance. Did Maurice Payne question our commitment to it? Not at all. Is there any suggestion that we could be expelled? Only from the media. Nowhere else? Not to my knowledge. Have any other Five Eyes members raised um, the comments that you made in your speech earlier this week with you or with the New Zealand government? No. Okay. The US, the US intelligence community released a report recently saying that China is one of its biggest threats. Is China a rising threat? China has, uh, and, and this was uh, evident in my speech for those who are interested uh, to read it, I'd, I'd divert them to the uh, Beehive website, and I did state in my speech that China is becoming increasingly assertive uh, in the region. Is assertive code for threatening? Uh, in some parts of the region, it's certainly uh, acting in a way that is increasing tension, and that's uh, of concern to New Zealand. And we've expressed those concerns in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, the way in which it's behaving in relation to Xinjiang and also Hong Kong. You discussed today Sahara Aden with Maurice Payne, and that was described as constructive conversations. I mean, what does that mean, constructive? Have you, have you got a solution? Constructive to the degree that we know we need to work together to try and uh, find a, a pathway forward and to work through some very complex issues. Uh, so New Zealand has been working with both Turkish and Australian authorities around this particular case and uppermost in our mind is the well-being of the children and the family. So does Australia accept any responsibility for this woman? Well, we discussed these issues in terms of the revoking of citizenship, uh, and these are challenging issues for Australia. We did raise it with them, uh, and we have raised it with them previously, and we continue to work together through the, the remaining complex set of issues uh, to work our way forward uh, for a solution that's going to be good uh, for, for Aiden. Just to be clear on that, when you raised your concerns with Australia's foreign Minister, did she concede that they have any responsibility for this woman? Well, those are issues that we discussed and the complexities of revoking citizenship. It's really important, without going too much into the detail of the issue, that revoking citizenship in itself is very difficult, but successful reintegration and making sure in terms of care of the children, we're thinking about how that might occur under these particular circumstances. So you've not managed to persuade Australia to change their position in any way in relation to this they're, woman? They're very alert to our concerns around how this issue is uh, being worked through. We remain But what does that mean, Minister? As much as we can. Minister, when you say that they're very alert to your concerns, what does that mean? They're aware that you're worried, but they're just ignoring it? It means that we raise the issue of stripping citizenship as we work through the complex set of issues. Where is this woman at the moment, Minister? This, this woman is where she's always been, uh, and, and she is in uh, the care of Turkish authorities. Uh, and so it's really important that we're able to work with the Turkish authorities and the Australian authorities on how to proceed on repatriating them. When you say she's being looked after by Turkey or in the care of Turkey, however you put it, is that because Australia and New Zealand cannot sort out who is responsible for her and where she is going? 
It's because there are issues around in relation to the children, their citizenship. These are already matters that are, to an extent, in the public domain. But I don't really want to delve into the detail uh, of the. I'm not. I'm not asking you for the detail, concerned. Minister. But simply put, it is because neither Australia nor New Zealand can resolve this situation, isn't it? That's, that she remains incorrect. in Turkey. That's incorrect. There okay. are a complex set of issues that we are work, all working together on uh, to be able to determine uh, how to uh, address the reintegration of uh, Aidan and her children uh, and, where, and, and who's responsible uh, for what, how that happens. And also, put we, simply, have COVID, we have no, no, put right. simply, we have COVID-19. It's not simply a matter of being able to make a decision today and something happening tomorrow. There are complex issues involved. Okay, so when you say she's in the care of Turkey, is she locked up? Is she in jail? Or how is she being cared for and held? She, look, there's a whole lot of privacy issues, but what's already in the private, uh, in the public domain is that she uh, is is being detained. The care of the children, we have checked on that and, and they remain well, well looked after. Nā mihi motera, Minister. Thank you for joining us this evening. That is Foreign Minister Nanaya Mahuta. It is almost 19 minutes past five and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. And still to come on the programme, we take a walk through a vaccination clinic in Sydney to see how the rollout is working there. It's emerged the government didn't consult surrounding businesses before approving hotels for use as MIQ facilities. Now a dispute between the owners of the Stamford Plaza Hotel in Auckland and the owners of a restaurant that operated on the ground floor is heading to court. Katie Todd reports. Bo and Edward Viterbo say they're among the longest serving restaurant owners in Auckland, having started three successful Thai restaurants since 1988. But their 13 year reign running Grasshopper on the ground floor of the Stamford Plaza Hotel has ended after the hotel became an MIQ facility, something the Viterbos claim they had no say in and only found out by accident in June. We got locked out one day in car park and discovered that they've actually changed all the locks and that's when we found out that they have been approved as an MIQ and so we were really quite surprised that we weren't informed about it. As busloads of returnees trundled into the fenced off Stamford Plaza in July, the grasshopper kept taking bookings from the public and helped prepare some meals for returnees. But Mr Viterbo says he became increasingly uncomfortable with his staff mingling with hotel staff behind the scenes. MB says there was no intermingling at the Stamford Plaza that put diners at risk. Yet Mr Viterbo maintains staff shared hallways, kitchens and delivery areas. When a returnee escaped from the Stamford Plaza in July, he says Grasshopper's loyal customers began to turn their backs and profits plunged. Our customers just don't want to come. And our sales showed that, you know, it just took a dive. So we ran a campaign on Facebook and asked our customers, and out of 300 respondents, 299 said, there's no way, no way in hell we're going to that place because it's just too risky, you know. In September, the restaurant closed, 15 employees lost their jobs, and the relationship between the hotel owners and restaurant owners imploded. Now both parties are heading to court. Stamford Plaza's owners are claiming $270,000 in unpaid rent, fees and utilities. Lawyer for Stamford Land, Benedict Tan, says the dispute has nothing to do with the hotel becoming an MIQ facility. He says Grasshopper's owners already owed money and had been trying to get out of their lease early. Grasshopper's owners dispute the fees associated with ending their lease and any suggestions they'd tried to get out early. They claim they'd simply asked for help during disruption from the City Rail Link project and they wouldn't have needed to close if the hotel hadn't become an MIQ facility. Bova Turbo says the government offered no help. They don't care, they just want to get the place as an MIQ up and running. 
Last month, Auckland Central MP Chloe Swarbrick wrote to COVID-19 Response Minister Chris Hipkins asking what consideration was given to businesses surrounding the Stamford Plaza before it became one of the country's 32 MIQ hotels. Hipkins said during the site assessments of each potential MIQ hotel, their proximity to other businesses was noted. However, surrounding businesses weren't part of the government site assessments. Other businesses say they've benefited from operating in or near MIQ hotels. Auckland e-bike tour company Power to the Pedal used to operate out of the Pullman Hotel car park and foyer. When the hotel became an MIQ facility, they shifted down the driveway. Despite losing the international visitors who made up 80% of its customers, the wheels are still turning on the business. Owner Eddie Jack is happy with the way it's been handled by the government and the hotel. It's obviously been very tough for them and a huge amount of respect for anybody who works in any of these facilities because you're putting yourself in an environment where there can be and there has been uh, COVID. So it's obviously a very stressful time for them, but when they first became MIQ. They contacted us to let us know. They helped us. Well, they moved uh, our stuff out of the hotel for us. And so, yeah, ever ever since um, where we have contact, it's all kind of very friendly. Bo and Edward Viterbo say the door is open to Stamford Plaza's owners to resolve their disagreement through mediation before heading to court. For Checkpoint, call Katie Todd, TNA. Auckland police staff have found themselves in the middle of a whodunit over cash that went missing from a stolen vehicle that had been seized by officers. But investigations have turned up nothing and the matter remains a cold case. Nick Trubridge has more. It's the curious case of the stolen car and the missing cash. But this time, it's the police who find themselves among the suspects. It all started when a stolen car was taken back to a Waitamata police station after crashing during a pursuit in Auckland. A wallet containing $140 was photographed in the car during the initial examination by officers. That cash was missing when it was later examined. That's a voiced passage from the subsequent Independent Police Conduct Authority investigation into the actions of police staff that day. So who took the $140? That remains a mystery despite police staff being investigated for the suspected theft. While police interviewed the staff who may have been responsible and reviewed CCTV footage, unfortunately they could not identify who took the cash. Former policeman and negotiator Lance Burdett says whenever police find cash, it's photographed in position, then seized and photocopied so the serial numbers are recorded. Forms are filled out, signed and the money's placed in a sealed bag and lodged in the property and exhibit store. So how does money seized by the police simply disappear? It could be any number of uh, reasons that perhaps the money could have been left on a desk somewhere and somebody's come past and, and grabbed it. Um, who would know? There, there's always a clear line. That if, whenever you discover anything that's valuable, it should never leave the officer's sight. That's the number one rule. There must be a, that's, it must be secured in some way that it's taken and it lodged, until it's lodged in a safe inside the property and exhibit store. Burdett's worked for police drug squads where large amounts of cash are often handled. It's just never a thought of taking money. It does happen on occasion and for every time that I've known that money has gone missing, it's always been a process error in some way. It's been found somewhere or it's been given to somebody and haven't signed the documentation. I have never heard of theft of money um, but certainly from a police officer. But he says the IPCA report seems weird because it does not have a clear conclusion. There's an obvious gap in the case and this raises questions, Burdett says. Where, where the gap occurred and why couldn't you find out the final outcome, you know? IPCA General Manager Sarah Goodall told Checkpoint the authority agrees there is not sufficient evidence for any criminal charges. The case is effectively unresolved, she says, because it hasn't been possible for police to identify who took the money or where it's gone. University of Auckland law professor Mark Hennigan says if a police officer was charged in the case, then the crime is potentially more serious than a standard theft. It's bad enough in itself, but when you're acquired to account, it becomes even arguably more serious because you're in a situation where you're, you know, the public trusts you to account for things. If stolen cars come in, for example, you're acquired to account for them. In other words, you, you will take care of all the that are in there because the, 
the owner of the stolen car wants to make sure all their belongings are still in the car. So you have an, you know, an added obligation in that respect. Checkpoint has approached the police with a number of questions about the suspected theft, but is yet to receive a response. The IPCA's findings say police have reinforced appropriate cash handling practices with the staff involved. For Checkpoint, Nick Trubridge. Wellington bus drivers who go on strike tomorrow have been told they'll be locked out indefinitely. The strike is planned for 24 hours from 4am tomorrow. But this afternoon, things came to a head and the industrial action could go on much longer. Our reporter Harry Locke joins me now from our Wellington studio. Harry, excuse the expression, but let's back up the bus a little. Now, why did the union decide to go on strike? Kia ora, Lisa. Yes, well, this uh, strike has been kind of many months in the working negotiations between the Tramways Union, which represents the bus drivers, and NZ Bus, which is just one of the operators, actually, which operate uh, the MetLink Greater Wellington Regional Council Public Transport Service. Those negotiations have been going on for many months over the new collective agreement. Now, a new one was offered on Friday by NZ Bus. That was wholeheartedly, near unanimously, rejected by the members members of the union who work for NZ Bus, the bus drivers. They say that while it does actually bring up their wages to the living wage, and that was actually part of, it's quite a complex situation, but that was as part of a deal with the regional council that they would pay their drivers the living wage. The union members and the union say that it also gets rid of a lot of the other things, part of their collective agreement, that they've worked hard to get, and that includes penal rates, you know, time and a half on weekends, uh, double time if they work past midnight. And so simply they they weren't having it. And so they uh, last week decided that they would reject the new collective agreement and would go on strike. Now, the strike notice was officially uh, handed over to the company NZ Bus this morning. And it is due to take place, due to begin at 4 a.m. tomorrow, lasting until 4 a.m. on Saturday. But what has happened in the meantime? What has the bus company done? Yeah, so actually in the past, only the past couple of hours, the bus company has responded and I've got quite a few documents here. So just after three o'clock, the union was uh, emailed by NZ bus uh, and basically said that from 4am on Saturday, so that is at the end of the strike, that the workers involved, the drivers involved in the strike would then be locked out and that lockout would be continuous. It would begin at 4am on Saturday 24th of April uh, and it would uh, be continuing until a new collective agreement was date, uh, was uh, signed on, was agreed by the drivers and the uh, that was the collective agreement from last Friday. So until they accepted that, they would uh, continue to be locked out. And I've, I've, I've been given a statement from uh, the chief operating officer of NZ Bus, Jay Zemeski, uh, and he basically says, we've been left with no option but to issue a lockout notice to drivers. Uh, they said that the strike action by the union is very disruptive and the union's threat of further surprise attack strikes means we can't guarantee the safety and reliability of our services. Now I must say this has been, uh, th- this response by NZ Bus has been wholeheartedly uh, kind of well MetLink have said that they are deeply disappointed uh, and surprised by the decision. They said that they have been working constructively with both parties on a way forward and just this morning we had commitment from NZ Bus that they would attend a mediation process facilitated by MetLink. Now that mediation process was due to happen on Tuesday but I've actually been told by the, uh, the Secretary of the Wellington branch of the Tramways Union that while a lockout carries on, no mediation will take place between the union and the company. So this just means that there is a a bit of stalemate going on now uh, as to when the negotiations can begin again. So we're almost out of time, Harry, but in terms of disruption, how widespread are you expecting it to be? Yeah, I mean, what we should say is that actually the uh, the NZ bus operate pretty much confined solely to Wellington City. So the greater Wellington region doesn't need to uh, be uh, overly kind of concerned about how this might impact their travel. But if you are within Wellington and use most of the Wellington services, I'm not going to read out all the numbers. It's best to go onto the MetLink website as to the exact service route which will be disrupted. Uh, but they are pretty much confined to Wellington City. And so if you are using a bus uh, with within Wellington, then you will uh, most likely be affected by these strikes and and the, the subsequent lockout. Thanks, Harry. That's Harry Locke joining us from our studio in Wellington there with the details of that bus driver's strike.
The curtain is coming down for elephants at Auckland Zoo as the last two pack their trunks for Australia. The zoo's confirmed that Anjali is being adopted by Taronga Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo, while Burma is going to Australia Zoo in Queensland. A decision was made to rehome the two remaining elephants when Auckland Zoo realised it wasn't possible to build a family herd for them here. Leader of the elephant team, Andrew Coas, explains why. The easiest way that I've, I can kind of explain it, it's, it's more of a friendship than a kind of a maternal bond between mother and daughter. They've only known each other for five years. Um, and in some ways for Angela, like being born at the um, orphanage of where we got her from in Sri Lanka there, that she she was in and around elephants and they were coming and going kind of all the time. So, you know, even meeting Burma the first time, it wasn't really a big deal for Angela. But on Burma, on the other hand, it was, you know, it was... You know, only the third elephant um, that she had met within the facility here at, um, at Auckland Zoo. So, again, Burma's just that slightly bit different where she spent 30 years uh, here on her own, and it, and it is going to be, um, you know, somewhat an adjustment for her, um, you know, compared to what it would be for Angelie. Was there no possibility that either of these zoos could take both elephants? Um, we definitely looked at it, definitely talked about it, but uh, again, um, you know, what, what boom is going to gain, like both these facilities are great, and that's, I guess we've got to understand that both of these facilities um, are great facilities, and um, that's where it is looking about, looking at what, you know, Australia Zoo is going to offer for Burma versus what Taronga Western Plains Zoo is. And that's where, again, it is about, um, you know, the opportunity that Burma gets, but also having the support of her, um, you know, her keepers with her to allow her to, um, you know, really get the best chance to um, get in amongst and form relationships with those other elephants. And, And that's where, I guess, the management styles are slightly different between the two facilities, and it's a little bit harder to achieve that at Taronga Western Plains. And... Taronga Western Plains, um, you know, is only the facility that can offer um, a chance for Angelie to be naturally bred. And ultimately, um, for her, that's a bit of a priority at her age is to get her into position naturally bred, see if she can actually conceive to then be um, a mother of her own. And I guess, you know, you often hear me say there's nothing more enriching uh, for a female elephant than, than being a mother just because if you've had kids, anyone's had, had kids would understand, or an absolute handful, well, it's the same for an elephant. And so that's where, um, you know, it keeps them all very busy. Could you not have sent Anjali away and, and just got a new friend for Burma? Um, no, like, you know, uh, like our preference um, when we were weighing up all of these options, one of the other options, um, you know, that we were really investing in is to see if we could make work was actually sending Angelie on a breeding holiday to Australia and bringing her back. And um, and I guess that was our from from an elephant team point of view, that was our preferred option. However, there were so many other things that were weighing in, um, and there's so many associated risks with all of that. But ultimately, um, we don't want to do what zoos have done for many, many years, and that's just have one or two elephants, um, you know, coexisting in a paddock. Our intention all along with bringing Angelie in was always to establish a family unit. Angelie was meant to be accompanied with another female um, from Sri Lanka, but it, it kind of got caught up um, in a court case through some other um, situations, and that's where that female never came. So we, we couldn't really see a path around how we could build that kind of family structure that's really important to us. So ultimately, we want to try and build a multi-generational group, as you would see elephants um, out there in the wild. And it just was proving too difficult to achieve that um, here in New Zealand. Will there ever be elephants at the zoo again, at Auckland Zoo? Um, I guess there's always a process to bring elephants into the country, but I just... I personally can't see it. I, I, I believe this is the last time you'll see elephants here in New Zealand. And I think that's what's probably gutting for all of us. And, you know, and, and you know, we're obviously have accepted the decision and, and very much aware um, of what's going on. And I guess our focus now is about setting up, um, you know, both Angelie and Boom for the best sort of move and the smoothest move that we can do. Um, yeah, but however, sitting in the back of my mind and when the visitors come in and seeing the, you know, the young kids really engaging with the elephants is knowing that you know, this is the last generation of, of Kiwi kids that are going to see elephants you know, um, you know, in the flesh in New Zealand. And I think that's 
yeah, it's pretty difficult um, coming and seeing every day. But yeah, we just we just cherish them while we've got them and spend as much time as we can um, with them while they're here. And sorry for my ignorance, but how do you move an elephant? Uh, it's it's pretty it's, well. It sounds pretty random, but no, it's pretty. It's all pretty straightforward. It's it's a matter of. Um, uh, a transport crate and then um, Burma especially because she's slightly bigger than Angela literally just fits in an aeroplane and so uh, we will um, fly them to Australia and um, and then there's uh, a bit of road travel um, at the other end to get them to the final destinations but yeah it's, it's ultimately they're in a transport crate and then um, over the next few months um, we're going to get them conditioned to those crates and get them used to them and try and really get them as comfortable uh, to those areas as possible. And I guess the best we do that, then, you know, again, the more smoother that that transport can be. So it's jumbo air? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could, you could say that. And that was the leader of the elephant team at Auckland Zoo, Andrew Kors. <laughs> on Checkpoint on RNZ National. We take a look through a vaccination clinic in Sydney to find out how the rollout is working there. People living in isolated areas hope health reforms will actually mean equal access. And the proposed golf course redevelopment that could, well, shave off 100 k from the price of every neighbouring house. Homai o whakaoro. We'd love to hear from you about anything you've heard on the programme tonight, our relationship with Australia. The elephants on the move from Auckland Zoo. Anything on your mind? Text us 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email us checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Standing by very patiently with the headlines is Susanna. The Foreign Minister says the only suggestion New Zealand could be expelled from the Five Eyes intelligence grouping is from the media. Nanaia Mahuta and Australia's Foreign Minister Maurice Payne meet in Wellington today with Five Eyes one of the topics up for discussion. Ms Mahuta told Checkpoint, to her knowledge, the expulsion suggestion has not come from anywhere else. The owners of an Auckland restaurant on the ground floor of an MIQ facility say it was forced to close because diners were scared off by potential COVID-19 cases. The Auckland couple who ran the restaurant, the Grasshopper, say they wanted a say in the hotel's decision to accept returnees. They also believe the government should have consulted businesses surrounding hotels before it approved them for use as MIQ facilities. A study of blood samples has revealed eight cases of COVID-19 that went previously undetected in the community. Auckland University's Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences tested nearly 10,000 samples of blood donations from New Zealanders to see if they had antibodies for the virus. India has reported a new record for new daily cases, 300,000 new daily cases and more than 2,000 deaths. The largest single day numbers since the pandemic began. India's health care is on the brink of collapse as a second wave of the coronavirus is spreading at an unprecedented rate. Wellington bus drivers who go on strike tomorrow will then be locked out indefinitely. NZ Bus has told their union that following the end of the strike, the 100 drivers involved will be locked out. The company says the lockout will be extended until the union agrees to the collective agreement. University annual reports show a huge bill for redundancies at the University of Auckland last year. They also show a big drop in income from foreign students across the sector. Those are the latest news headlines from RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at six. Thanks, Susanna. No mai hoki mai, you're listening to Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. Let's get to the business news now with Nicholas Poynton. Nicholas, the government is beefing up deposit protections. This is so if you've got money in the bank, it won't go west? Yeah, pretty much. So this was a move announced this morning and as you mentioned, it's designed to protect depositors in the event should there be a significant financial downturn, something like a bank collapsing. The scheme was actually proposed a couple of years ago and the way it works is the way that this scheme will work is that you know if you have money tied up in a bank or a credit union, something like that, and it fails, you will be insured for up to $100,000. Now, that's double the original limit that was proposed, but it's been increased to protect about 93% of all depositors. And it's expected to come into effect in 2023 as part of a broader suite of measures to really strengthen the regulation and the supervision of our financial system. But some would say that this depositor you know, insurance scheme is coming, to, is coming to effect a little bit later than 
things some would have some would have liked. I think New Zealand is, if not the only country in the OECD, one of very few that doesn't have a scheme like this in place. We've been operating with something that's called an open banking resolution. And what that means is if a bank failed, the losses would be equally shared. So there's still a lot more detail to come on this, and it's likely to be paid in the form of a levy to banks. That's, as, uh, that's why they build up the funds for the insurance, and it may need some government backing in the initial stages until they get there. There were some other measures to be unveiled today, and, that, and, and then they sort of spell out what the RBNZ can do to control risky lending. The way things work at the moment is that the central bank has to get approval for any measures that it may like to introduce, so this is seen as a way to borrow a piece of jargon, streamline that process. Okay, let's move on to QEX. Now, this is a shipping company and it's had a few issues. Oh, this is a company I've always sort of wanted to talk about in this program, but it's always, you know, it hasn't made enough news to really warrant it. It's relatively small fry on our, you know, stock exchange. But today, about just over an hour ago, QEX Logistics announced that it's planning to delist from the stock exchange and become a private company three years after listing. And it follows what can only be described as a remarkable journey to this point. This is a company that specializes in shipping uh, and exporting primary goods to China. But, you know, the last six months of this firm has been incredibly testing. The difficulty really began in October last year. That's when the company made this announcement to the stock exchange that it had lost $4 million worth of inventory from a warehouse in Shanghai. They alleged that, or they presumed that it had been stolen, but they were unable to recover the stock. They said their insurance wouldn't cover it, and that led them to report a half-year loss of about $4 million. Things didn't improve for the company as they came into the new year, and in sort of mid-February, they announced to the market that it had actually breached their uh, debt obligations. This led all of the company's independent directors to resign en masse. And when that happened, the, the market regulator, NZ Regco, they had to place the company in a trading halt. Its shares were unable to be traded, and that's because you're not allowed to be listed with, or not allowed to, uh, you know, be on the market without independent directors. So they had to go out and find replacements. But a week later, the company revealed that the Ministry for Primary Industry, uh, Industries rather, had brought charges against him in November of last year for for allegedly breaching the Animal Product Act. NBI alleged that the chief executive and the company had attempted to export animal products without going through the proper disclosure processes. And those charges carry penalties of about $100,000 for the chief executive and half a million dollars for the company. Now that caught the attention of the regulator again because it was thinking, why didn't you tell us about this happening in November? Why are you waiting until February to tell us? And that led them to open up an investigation into sorry, into the company, there are findings of which have not been released. Now, we think this brings up into sort of, you know, last month, the chief financial officer, they resigned, the auditor, it resigned. So the company's looking to delist because it believes it's in the best interest of its shareholders because it's been unable to really find replacement directors, take it out of that sort of trading halt because of the negative publicity that surrounded the firm. So it's going to need approval from its shareholders and the NZX to delist, but the next step for the company, if it can get through all those final, you know, over those final hurdles, we'll be looking to sell the business. Well, okay, let's take a quick whip around the markets. So our own NZX Top 50, it rose about 42 points to 12,577. The New Zealand dollar is steady, trading at 71.9 US cents, 92.8 Australian and 51.6 pence. Thanks, Nicholas. Nicholas point in with business. The public and doctors hope general practices will be cheaper and easier to access once health reforms take place. The government announced yesterday a major shake-up to the country's health system with one entity to replace DHBs. Jordan Bond reports. Emergency departments have been bursting at the seams, some going into code black, telling people to stay away unless they're really in an emergency. Some of this demand is non-emergency issues that people can't afford to pay to see their GP for. Sunisha of Grey Lynn used to work in a hospital and her husband was in the emergency department. She says on nights and weekends when after-hours doctors cost more, EDs fill up. So much of what comes through isn't actually an emergency and all those resources um, that are used then to address those patients could be put elsewhere and likewise the patients that have to come to ED wait for six hours for something minor. 
Other Aucklanders RNZ spoke to say they're generally well served by their GPs, but some put off going because of the cost. They should put the price down anyway, in general. A lot of people avoid, avoid doing that because they don't want to pay money. Maybe it should be more of like a means tested thing, free if you're under, earning under a certain amount. The fact that people feel they can't afford to go to their GP and they have to go to the hospital, big problem. It could be possibly that they have to work more than one job and that they're not able to go to the GP during normal working hours and black cross is going to be two or three times more expensive so I can understand why they would go to a hospital. Aside from knowing things will change, GPs know very little about what will change. The devil is in the detail, was often uttered. Family doctors, though, are optimistic the shake-up will be good for them and therefore good for patients. A GP who practices in South Auckland and Christchurch, Api Talimaitonga, says he hopes general practice is prioritised more. In my view, decisions have tended to be hospital heavy. If we're serious about keeping a focus on keeping people well and out of hospital, well, we need to fund primary care who do the bulk of their work. You know, we, we know our patients best. The medical director of the College of GPs, Brian Betty, says it was necessary to rebuild a system he says was failing on a lot of levels. He says general practices are under immense pressure at the moment. That's both from workloads, what's happening, and the way general practices are remunerated in New Zealand. Again, we don't have detail on what that looks like in terms of the reforms at this point. But we would certainly expect general practice and general practitioners to be part of the discussions on what this new system looks like over the next 12 to 24 months. Dr Tali Maitonga, who's also the chair of the Pacifica GP network, says to increase equity, doctors need to think outside the box, like being open late or offering live video consultations. It's not just the cost. It's the opportunity to visit your GP. So that's where virtual platforms are really important. Or opening extended hours as people do their double shifts at the factory and there's just one car at home. The health minister says the transition to the new system starts now and people will have the opportunity to have their say on what the health services should look like. For Checkpoint, call Jordan Bond. Aho. A Sydney GP says Australian vaccination clinics have faced transparency and supply issues in their bid to help protect the country against COVID-19. The Commonwealth-funded GP-led vaccination clinics are part of Australia's vaccine rollout. So far, more than 1.6 million doses of the vaccine have been delivered across Australia. That's a far cry from the government's initial target of vaccinating 4 million people by the end of March. As our Ministry of Health works through the details of how GP clinics will be used in our own vaccine rollout. Reporter Tess Brunton and videographer Simon Rogers visited a GP-led vaccination clinic in Sydney to find out how it's working there. Three days a week, a vaccination clinic opens up opposite the Northbridge Medical Practice in Sydney's Lower North Shore for morning and afternoon sessions. The signs start as you enter the lobby. Turn left for the vaccine clinic or right to see your GP. Dr Brian Morton, who set up the appointment-only clinic, says they're now booked out weeks in advance after first opening in late March. It's about 160 a day. Uh, not quite that many, but uh, to cover the, the um, full 400 vac doses. If we drop down, <laughs> then we won't, we can, we're not guaranteed of continuing that 400 doses a week. The rooms set aside for the clinic are simple and sparse. People are greeted at the front admin desk before walking through to a larger room with socially distanced seating at both ends. One is for those waiting and the other is for those who have had the vaccine to sit down for 15 minutes to check for any immediate issues. The vaccinators take each person into a separate room with two desks, each with a tray of pre-loaded syringes, a laptop, cotton buds, a bin, band-aids and a pile of papers. They check people's details, their eligibility for a jab and go over the potential side effects before asking for consent and picking up their syringe. Okay. Just relax your arm, needle prick. 
Most of the people we saw had booked their appointment and completed their paperwork online. Dr Brian Morton says they have five minute slots so they can make the most of the time. But opening the clinic hasn't been without its hurdles. They faced a big one in their first week. There was a delivery failure and so we had to cancel um, a whole day's worth of patients and that's extremely frustrating and when you're booked out for a month in advance, uh, where do you put them? And um, you know, that was the, the first big problem hiccup. And it wasn't just the supply issue that caused frustration. Dr Morton says transparency and communication has been lacking. He says some general practices still don't know why they weren't chosen or how the numbers of vaccines have been allocated. We need to be regularly informed of any hiccup or any change. And it's not really good enough to post it online and say it's on the website because one, you've got to be aware and when you're giving patients um, uh, every five minutes a COVID vaccine and it has to be efficient and quick to cover the population, um, you can't be uh, looking at your emails um, or website or alerts. It needs to be really a, a very slick process from the top down. He's also fighting against misinformation and sensationalism. You walk into a chemist and the pharmacist said to me, all these medications on the shelf have greater number of side effects than in fact the vaccine. So there's been an unreality um, about the risk to the community of a vaccine. That slows down the process as those giving the vaccines need to ensure people are well informed before they agree to a jab. Right now, they can only offer the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was the backbone of the country's vaccination strategy. But earlier this month, the rollout faced a major shakeup when AstraZeneca was no longer recommended for people under 50, following concerns of rare blood clots potentially linked to the vaccine. As Dr Morton puts it, the risk is very low, but the process is built on informed consent. To be honest, I'd wait. Okay. Because uh, we probably will get the Pfizer because they've changed the... Um, storage things yeah. to say we can store it for two weeks in a freezer okay whereas it doesn't fit in in the hubs at the hospital with no community cases at present dr morton says it can be better to wait for the pfizer vaccine for some healthy fit under 50s the first person i've said don't, don't go away but i think because that yeah. risk of COVID infection yeah. is so low at the moment, mm. it's worth your waiting okay. because of your All right. age. We'll, we'll do that. Keep an eye on the website and sure. the media will tell you. Okay. The man decided to hold out for the Pfizer vaccine instead. Dr Morton says GP-led clinics are an obvious choice to help get the population vaccinated as they're a specialised group well-versed in administering vaccines. He says they also have a moral responsibility to protect the community. If you compare it to our hospital, uh, higher risk people working in COVID uh, virus wards, working in intensive care, they didn't say, no, I'll stay at home because the risk is too high. They stepped up to it. So I think general practice needed to step up. Meanwhile, each patient who visits here will return in roughly 12 weeks for a second AstraZeneca shot. Dr Brian Morton is hopeful more GP-led vaccination clinics can be set up in the coming months to aid Australia's rollout. In Sydney for Checkpoint, Cortes Brunton, TNA. And you can watch Tess and Simon's story on our website or on our Checkpoint Facebook page. People living in isolated areas lacking health services want their voices heard following the health reforms announcement. Health Minister Andrew Little says a new entity, Health NZ, will strive to make sure everyone, no matter where they live, will have access to the same level of health care. But in more remote parts of the country, people fear being forgotten and want to see issues they're facing addressed. Alicia Foon reports. Getting the right medical help often comes with lengthy wait times and frustrations for many isolated communities. 
Health NZ, the new entity set to change Aotearoa's healthcare system, is being cautiously welcomed by people from the tip of the country to the south. Far North's Tehiku Peninsula has accessibility issues, and many Māori face cost barriers when it comes to healthcare. Errol Murray is the general manager of Whakawhiti Pai, which runs three clinics in Northland. He says the Māori Authority is a bright light at the end of the tunnel and hopes the many hurdles they face are tackled. They want access to services in a timely manner rather than waiting months on end. Uh, they want to, when they've been given an appointment, when the one finally comes up, they want it to be on a, a day and a time that's suitable to them uh, because of the distance. There's only one power source that comes along the peninsula here, so it's not unusual for the power to go off, which means everything basically shuts down. He welcomes the reform and says it could give Māori and isolated communities a greater voice in the health system. The government will be canvassing views of Māori medical experts, iwi and providers across the country in the coming months. Donna Matahari Atariki is the chair of Southern Iwi provider Otako Health Limited. She's pleased to see the government acknowledging the downfall for Māori, particularly for those living in hard-to-reach areas. We've had a number of reports that show clearly the inequity for Māori um, as patients, both in terms of their human rights, in terms of the treaty, where we have been completely underserved for way too long. Christy James is from a group called Save Our Wanaka Midwives. In June 2019, she gave birth on the floor of a midwife's office and is disappointed to still be waiting for a primary birthing unit in Wanaka after being promised one by Southern DHB last year. She's hopeful about the health reforms so long as smaller communities are prioritised. It's been a long waiting game. We've been, oh, we started Save Our Wanaka Midwives about four years ago now and literally pretty much nothing has changed. So... Um, I really hope that with the health reform that enables government to just shift their focus and hopefully look to the rural areas um, in order to um, make some real changes happen here. Jill Naylor, who's the president of advocacy group Rural Women, hopes technology will be used to help rural communities become more connected with the health system. We are pleased that the minister has said that the kind of treatment people get will no longer be determined by where they live. Um, that, and we need to make sure that rural postcodes aren't in the losing lottery. She says there are a raft of issues that need to be addressed. We have um, instances of a two-hour drive to breast cancer appointments, going into labour at midnight within a no-cell coverage area, three hours drive from a hospital, and the rescue helicopters on another rescue. Telehealth being offered where there's insufficient technology and patchy coverage and little or no internet or broadband service. She says when the changes are implemented, analysis should be done to see how the rural population and women are impacted to see if it helps provide better services. For Checkpoint, Ko Elisha Fountenne. Some quick feedback before the news at six. Grant's got in touch to say, in my opinion, New Zealand should be taking a tougher line on China. Too bad if they reduce trade. There are plenty of other markets to sell to. RNZ News at 6, nga mahi nui ko Susana Leata with DNA. Australia and New Zealand's foreign ministers have plastered on smiles during their first face-to-face -face meeting, despite an assortment of trans-Tasman tensions. Maurice Payne has made quick use of the new two-way travel bubble, sitting down with her counterpart Nanaia Mahuta in Wellington today. Here's our Deputy Political Editor, Craig McCulloch. The two ministers discussed an array of topics, including COVID-19, China and the Sahara Aden case. Australia prompted fury from Jacinda Ardern after it stripped the terror suspect of her citizenship, leaving New Zealand to pick up the pieces. Speaking to reporters this afternoon, Ms Payne said the ministers had constructive discussions on the matter, but had nothing to announce. She stressed Australia took New Zealand's concerns very seriously. From Parliament, Craig McCulloch. 
The Prime Minister says there are mechanisms in place for climate change protesters who feel they have been spied on to make a complaint. A two-year investigation by investigative journalist Nikki Hager has found school children who joined a peaceful protest against the oil exploration company OMV in New Plymouth a year ago were targets of the private investigation firm Thompson & Clark. Jacinda Ardern says there are rules for investigators that govern the way the industry works. And I would absolutely expect that they maintain those rules. There are mechanisms for complaints to be made if anyone believes that they have not been maintained. Jacinda Ardern says she expects that if complaints are properly raised, they will be looked into. The government didn't consult businesses surrounding hotels before it approved them for use as MIQ facilities. An Auckland couple who ran a restaurant on the ground floor of the Stamford Plaza Hotel says that's unfair and they wanted to say in the hotel's decision to accept returnees. The restaurant called Grasshopper kept operating for two months last year, divided from the rest of the Stamford Plaza with fences. But it's now closed and one of the owners, Edward Viterbo, claims diners were scared off by the potential potential COVID-19 cases next door. The whole business just died, you know, and so we decided uh, it is really untenable and, and unsustainable and so we decided to close, but of course the landlord did not agree with our decision. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment says hotels engage with stakeholders before becoming an MIQ. An Auckland doctor hopes general practices will embrace video call consultations to help more people get medical care. The Minister of Health has announced an overhaul of the country's health system and GPs want it to improve primary care. A doctor who practices in South Auckland and Christchurch, Api Talimaidonga, says to increase equity, doctors need to think outside the box. It's not just the cost. It's the opportunity to visit your GP. So that's where virtual platforms are really important. Or opening extended hours as people do their double shifts at the factory and there's just one car at home. Dr Api Talimaitonga says in addition appointments should be cheaper so issues can be identified before people need hospital level care. Fiji has two new locally transmitted cases of COVID-19. Permanent Secretary for Health Dr James Fong says they are two children from Wainitarao settlement in Cunningham, which is a containment area. A seven-month-old boy and a 14-year-old girl have tested positive and are the children of the 40-year-old woman from Cunningham who was earlier confirmed as a COVID-19 positive case. Dr Fong says they want everyone to know that they have not identified any new clusters of cases in the community. He says the brother and sister entered isolation before they became infectious. India has reported a new record for new daily cases, 300,000 new daily cases and more than 2,000 deaths, the largest single-day numbers since the pandemic began. India's health care is on the brink of collapse as a second wave of the coronavirus is spreading at an unprecedented rate. CNN's Anna Corrin reports. The daily number of infections has hit a record and it has surpassed the record in the United States. Uh, Speaking to to doctors, to health professionals, uh, to activists, they say that they have been warning the government for months, ever since that first wave in India died down. They said, you must stockpile, you must prepare for what is inevitable. But they say that the government has acted arrogantly, that it congratulated itself in surviving the first wave and that they didn't take any of the necessary precautions. Anna Corrin reporting. It's five minutes past six. The Phoenix coach, Yufa Katile, concedes he may have to roll the dice and play a couple of injured players in tonight's A-League football match against Western United and Launceston. The Phoenix are chasing their third straight win, which could see them climb to seventh, just a point outside of a playoff spot. Key defender Stephen Taylor is one of those still nursing a minor injury and with the Phoenix playing again on Sunday, Tele is weighing up the need for three points and the need to rotate players. A former chief executive of New Zealand Rugby struggles to see where the benefit for US tech giant Silver Lake lies in buying into the All Blacks. Next week, New Zealand Rugby will vote on whether to go ahead with the $460 million deal, which would give Silver Lake a 15% stake in the game here. David Moffat, who spent four years in charge, worries the deal will simply mean more meaningless exhibition games for the All Blacks, which will ultimately devalue the brand. 
Silver Lake are not benefactors. And I'm just struggling to see how they can increase the revenue return to New Zealand rugby and ultimately to themselves that New Zealand rugby couldn't do on their own. After all, they're the biggest rugby brand in the world. New Zealand Olympic athletes will have access to saliva tests for COVID-19 ahead of their departure for the Games in Tokyo. Japanese government immigration requires all athletes and staff to provide a negative PCR test within 72 hours of leaving for the event starting in July. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, our forest correspondent Dean Bagent Mercer on canopy collapse and the role 1080 will play in stopping it. Our foreign correspondent Shobhanarian is on the line from India, currently the eye in the storm that is the COVID-19 pandemic. Alison Balance revisits her 2010 investigation to ocean acidification and Melissa Lang's in training for Auckland's Festival of Urban Walking on nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service until midnight tomorrow. Northland to Taranaki, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Taumaranui and Taupo. Mostly fine tonight, isolated showers in the eastern Bay of Plenty ranges. Rain developing tomorrow afternoon and evening with possible thunderstorms in the north and west. For the remainder of the North Island, fine, but cloudy periods for Kapiti Coast and Wellington where rain develops tomorrow night. Nelson and Marlborough, fine, however rain with heavy falls developing tomorrow evening. Buller, Westland and Fiordland, fine and Buller. Rain developing elsewhere tonight. Widespread rain tomorrow with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms. Canterbury and North Otago, fine weather. Some high cloud tomorrow. For the remainder of Otago and Southland, fine spells tonight. Occasional rain in the west tomorrow with a few showers spreading further east in the evening. Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. RNZ National, it's coming up to eight minutes past six. Thanks, Susana. Kia ora anō. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. Australia and New Zealand's foreign ministers had plastered on smiles during their first face-to-face meeting, despite an assortment of festering trans-Tasman tensions. Maurice Payne has made quick use of the new two-way travel bubble, flying in yesterday and departing tomorrow. And in a carefully choreographed media conference this afternoon, every word was carefully chosen. Here's our Deputy Political Editor, Craig McCulloch. ministerial bursting of bubbles. Maurice Payne welcomed to New Zealand by her Kiwi counterpart Nanaia Mahuta, the first meeting of its sort in well over a year since before the COVID pandemic began. Welcome, it's so nice to be able to see you here (laughs) in person, but also the ability to have the conversations that we so need to have. And the need for those conversations has really been more pressing. In February, Jacinda Ardern excoriated Australia over the Sahara Aden case, the 26-year-old terror suspect detained in Turkey. New Zealand was landed with responsibility for the woman after Australia stripped her of citizenship without warning. If the shoe were on the other foot, we would take responsibility. That would be the right thing to do. And I ask of Australia that they do the same. The topic high on the agenda today, the talks supposedly constructive. Regardless of the steps that have been taken in this case to date, both New Zealand and Australia acknowledge that it now does have a number of complexities. We are working through those issues uh, in the spirit of our bilateral relationship. But no progress. It's far from the only pressure point between both countries. The long-standing disagreement over deportees was again canvassed, again dismissed. In focus too was the respective relationships with China, Australia doubling down on its hardline stance, ripping up two Belt and Road agreements in the past 24 hours. China's outlook, the nature of China's external engagement, both in our region and globally, has changed in recent years. Uh, And an enduring partnership requires us to adapt to those new realities. New Zealand, meanwhile, has been savaged in international media for its stance. The Telegraph labelling Jacinda Ardern the West's woke weak link. New Zealand has repeatedly declined to join its Five Eyes partners in criticising China 
instead raising its concerns independently. We do value the Five Eyes relationship, but whether or not that framework needs to be invoked every time on every issue, especially in the human rights space, is something that we have expressed further views about. My view is that countries will choose to address issues of concerns in whichever forum they themselves determine appropriate and consistent with their respective national interest. But our respect for each other, Australia, the United States, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and Canada, is enduring and continuing and one which we, particularly in Australia, value enormously. A diplomatic dance between the so-called closest of friends, a manicured stage show. Scott Morrison is due to cross the ditch in the very near future. Australian media reporting a trip in two weeks' time. Another chance to broach the thorny issues or to paper them over. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Craig McCulloch. And speaking of Australia, health authorities in Western Australia and New South Wales are scrambling to track down returned travellers who were possibly exposed to COVID-19 in hotel quarantine. In Perth, genomic testing results show, well, they reveal two travellers staying on the same floor in opposite rooms caught the virus while in quarantine, not overseas as previously thought. Meanwhile, New South Wales Health is investigating whether COVID-19 spread inside one of its quarantine hotels for the second time in a week. The ABC's Bridget Fitzgerald reports. While New South Wales Health has established that three returned travellers from two families staying in adjacent rooms have all tested positive for the same viral sequence of COVID-19, it's still unclear how they actually caught it. The three arrived in Australia on the same flight, which means they may have had some contact, as Deakin University's Chair in Epidemiology, Catherine Bennett, explains. The quick assumption is that we're probably seeing a similar thing to other episodes recently where people who've travelled together um, and transited from the airport to the hotel and importantly are on the same floor in the hotel seem to be sharing the same variant of virus. We can't rule out that they didn't acquire it pre-flight and been in an area where they're exposed, but we also can't rule out that it might not have happened within the hotel quarantine setting and it's, you know, it's the fact that they're in in adjacent rooms probably points to that. Health officials are now urgently contacting anyone who was staying on the 10th floor of the McCure Hotel in Sydney CBD between the 7th and the 12th of April who've already left quarantine in case they were exposed. New South Wales Health is also investigating how the virus was transmitted within another hotel, the Adena Apartment Hotel, a few days ago. Meanwhile, the WA Health Department has revealed two people staying in opposite rooms at Perth's McCure Hotel acquired COVID COVID-19 during their stay in quarantine. Guests are staying on the same floor who've already been released are being asked to get tested and self-isolate. That report from the ABC's Bridget Fitzgerald. It is almost 14 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Rotorua residents fighting to save Springfield Golf Course reckon a development on the site could wipe up to 100k off the value of every neighbouring house. But the group, Saving Springfield, says it's not about the money. Earlier this week, Checkpoint reported on a heated public meeting about the Rotorua Lakes Council proposal that could see the 70-year-old course absorbed into a new recreation precinct that would also include housing. The president of Saving Springfield, Robert Lee, is having none of it. The whole idea is uh, absolutely repugnant to uh, most people, uh, most residents. So we've been collecting a petition. uh, I would say nine out of ten people that we uh, encounter are very happy to sign the petition um, And there's about one out of ten who are either council employees or belong to the other club or uh, have special interests. And uh, but we have a a lot of support. So, so Robert, explain to me what is repugnant about this proposal? What is repugnant about losing the golf course? Uh, It's in the middle of uh, suburbia, and so there's a whole lovely suburb that's been built around the golf course, as you can imagine. And uh, this golf course really is the heart of the Springfield. When you Um, say, sorry to interrupt, Robert, when you say there is a lovely suburb that's built up around the golf course, Mm. some people think that that's part of the problem, 
that the people of Springfield have got used to having, well, good property prices on the basis that they back onto a golf course and they've got wonderful views and that part of the concern here is that you're going to lose property values. Is that part of the concern? Ah, the NIMBY argument, yes, of course, uh, that is uh, a, an issue and uh, we're not going to try and pretend it isn't, but it's actually not the driving uh, factor. Um, so what would it do but, to but your property not... prices if the golf course went? Uh, we've spoken to a real estate agent who specialises in the area. He estimates it would take 100000 off the value of every property that touches the course, so that's, uh, that's about 100 uh, houses. And it would take about 50000 off the value of properties across the road. And for the rest of the suburb, which is hundreds if not thousands of houses, uh, they, it would destroy the, uh, the, the neighbourhood, I believe. So that's got to hurt, that prospect? Well, well, it's uh, 10 million plus 10 million is 20 million dollars if you just count the 300 houses around the perimeter of the course. We don't really like to talk in terms of the financial uh, implications of it because to Springfield residents it means a hell of a lot more than just you know, numbers. But well, you, numbers do, you do know the numbers, Robert, so I'm just wondering here, is it about the golf course or is it about the money attached to your houses? Oh, it's, it's not about the money, but there are um, financial implications. So, for example, there's a lady who's recently been widowed. She's uh, spent her life building up, uh, working with her husband, got a nice retirement home all set up, and uh, she's now of retirement age, and now she can't even sell her house because the price values apparently have uh, dropped, so I've been told. But, you know... The Rotary Lakes Council uh, proudly have uh, put out a video uh, for the long-term plan consultation and they use words like, we want to make Rotary a great place to live, work, play and invest. Well, Springfield already is a great place to live, work, play and invest and this would turn 70 years worth of people's investments into a really bad investment. Well, if people have been there for a long time, Robert, then arguably their, their um, equity is strong in their properties. And Springfield, I hear from local people, it is a great place to live. And other people would like to be able to live there too. So what value do you think it has putting some houses on that golf course? Because you guys have got a real shortage of housing down there, don't you? We do have a real shortage of housing, and I think the blame for that has to fall squarely upon uh, the Mayor and the Council. Uh, so the Mayor has been in this job, this is their third term now, and the, the Council have been very slow at releasing properties. However, that said, there's 790 sections being released about two minutes drive from here next to the Springfield Golf Course. There's also another 2,000 uh, properties being released on the other side of town. And so uh, the, the housing issue is a red herring and uh, the council have sold this proposal to us as a sports precinct to be funded by housing, but not really as a solution to the housing problem. So what about then future generations? Because the council says it's faced with woefully inadequate sports fields and facilities that are not up to future capacity. So, so where should um, budding sports people in your region, I mean, what fields should they they play on in the years to come? Is golf a sport? What about other sports? Well, OK, let's talk about other sports. So you're talking, the proposal here is to destroy one sports field and replace it with other sports fields, which isn't really a net gain, is it? Imagine that you were speaking straight to the council now, Robert, and, well, you tell them. The people are speaking. Uh, you can ignore us if you like. We'll see at the 2022 election. We'll see how many people uh, support uh, the Westbrook Sports Precinct proposal uh, in terms of votes. And that was Robert Lee from the group Saving Springfield. We are here before you because we are scared. That was the message to Wellington councillors from the Alliance Against Sexual Violence this morning. Three weeks on from their rally, which called for more action against sexual violence, members are now voicing the demands to politicians. They want more funding for prevention organisations, better street safety and more prevention and intervention training for hospitality staff. Harry Locke reports. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey. 
At the beginning of April, around 500 people turned up at Wellington's nightlife district to demand action against sexual violence. They turned up to express their fear and their rage that they still feel afraid. The organisers, the newly formed Wellington Alliance Against Sexual Violence, are continuing in their mission, but now through different means. We are here before you today because we are scared. We are here before you today because it has been this way for far too long. We are here for every person that has been assaulted in our capital city. We are here for every person whose cries has fallen on deaf ears. And we are here before you today because we want change. This morning at a Wellington City Council meeting, Ella Lamont and Sophie Harrison turned up to demand more from the council. They presented the findings of their online survey, which had nearly 3,000 respondents. It found 10% say they experience sexual violence or abuse daily, while a third say it happens every weekend. It's not a small amount of people experiencing sexual assault and sexual violence. It is a huge group of people. And it's like an issue that we all need to take extremely seriously and we all need to play our role in making Wellington safer. The survey found over two-thirds think sexual assault and abuse is increasing in prevalence in Wellington. Nearly all respondents think there needs to be a culture change. Ella Lamont and Sophie Harrison want the council to make Courtney Place and the nightlife district safer and more pedestrian friendly. They want to increase funding for prevention-based organisations and they want to work with the hospitality industry to ensure all workers are trained to deal with sexual assault and abuse. Bars really should be taking care of their patrons regardless. You know, if you go and buy a drink, you're thinking this place should be keeping me safe because I'm their customer. But they're not. But yeah, yeah, they're not. We find that even if you go and say to a bouncer, this person is not OK or I've just seen this, they won't really do anything despite being the security. Matt McLaughlin, a hospitality owner-operator, says the industry's Don't Guess the Yes campaign is trying to address that exact problem. Training sessions teach hospitality staff prevention, intervention and response in the event of a sexual assault. We've put it out to the, to the whole industry. It's been a little bit sporadic as to who's come to the training sessions, but the first training session that we held, which was about two years ago, we got about 180 people turn up to an unpaid training meeting, which I thought was fantastic. It showed that the industry and, and our, the staff from our industry were really engaged in this issue. But not everyone's engaged with it. We've pushed Don't Guess the Yes pretty hard for the last sort of three years. We've got but those bars that, that want to be involved have had really good engagement. We've seen a lot of people, and I know that they are working really hard on that kind of stuff. But yeah, there's certainly bars that um, haven't been involved. Meanwhile, councillor and city safety portfolio lead, Tamitha Paul, says she is interested in trying to get more funding to prevention and response organisations. We will be taking a really hard look at where our grants funding goes because we give away millions and millions of dollars every year to all sorts of worthy causes, but I think we need to look at the scale of this issue, which is massive, and think about its importance in relation to other things that we give funding to. The funding of sexual violence prevention and response organisations is at the top of our priority list. At the council meeting, she also requested a report is done on how best to improve city safety and implement harm reduction initiatives. Ite Fonganui Atara, Motoho Taka Ota Ahi Ahine, Ko Harilok TNA. Users of Instagram will be able to filter out abusive messages and comments they receive as part of a range of content controls just announced. The change is being rolled out in several countries in the coming weeks. In the UK, there's widespread criticism of Instagram by Premier League clubs and leading footballers for allowing sexist and racist abuse to proliferate on the platform. But the BBC's Nesta McGregor has more. A growing number of black footballers have already left or are threatening to leave social media platforms, including Instagram. The company has reiterated that it is and always will be committed to tackling all forms of abuse. A new way of trying to do that is by giving users greater controls over who can message them privately. It's horrifying that people continue to receive this abuse. It's been happening for a long time and what we've been doing is responding um, over time based on the feedback that we've received. Fadzai Madzengera is head of content policy at Instagram. She says a new filtering system will block messages that contain offensive words, phrases and picture emojis. That is really what we're focused on, is making sure that we're finding the right balance of protecting our community and giving them control um, while working on this far more complex issue of ensuring that we're getting to 
bad actors that are on our platform. Instagram said users were not immediately removed for breaking its rules because education and reflection played an important role in combating abuse. It's also said it was important that some accounts were allowed to remain anonymous to enable freedom of speech, but that the platform would try to play its part in tackling racism. Nesta McGregor reporting. Cyclists have caused chaos in central Berlin, protesting for the German city to become more bike-friendly. The drive comes in the wake of the pandemic and is a push to prevent a return to pre-COVID levels of air pollution. This report from Deutsche Welle. Demonstrators in Berlin take to their bikes. They want more car-free cycling routes in the city centre, more pedestrian zones and generally fewer cars in the capital. I think there's enough infrastructure for motorised transport. What we need is to make more provision for cyclists. We need to fight for a greener Berlin. Meanwhile, cars can't get through, forced to make way for the cyclists. There needs to be space for both, not just the cyclists or the cars. Everyone's important. Today, the protesters are being allowed onto the city freeway. The police once again holding back the cars. Berlin's state government has adopted new transport policies in recent years, adding cycle lanes and converting some streets into cycling and pedestrian zones. But some want a more radical approach. We want a referendum on drastically reducing traffic in Berlin. Normally, the streets are stuffed full of cars, and we think that's unfair, especially in inner cities, where so many people no longer use a car, yet have to sacrifice so much space to them. Cars just aren't in keeping with the times anymore. In many parts of the world, inner cities are being rapidly transformed. There's no doubt that inner cities with fewer vehicles are more pleasant. Denmark's capital, Copenhagen, has banned all cars from the city centre. Paris is planning to plant more trees on the Champs-Élysées and around the Arc de Triomphe in an effort to cut traffic significantly. In New York, parts of Broadway near Times Square are already car-free, dotted with street cafes designed by Danish urban planners. Car makers have also understood that times are changing. VW has developed self-driving shuttles that it hopes will become the taxis of the future and help to cut inner city traffic. Our brand is moving from being a pure automaker to becoming a mobility provider. So whether you buy a car from us, lease or rent it or just use it, and whether you drive yourself or not, our business model works either way. Back to the bike rally in Berlin, where the demonstrators are making a beeline for the city's urban freeway. If they get their way, the German capital will one day no longer need a freeway, for cars at least. That report from Deutsche Welle. Some of your feedback before we head off. On the bus strike in Wellington, this listener says, as a bus user, I think it's time for a touch of no pay on any NZ buses during peak time. Lack of revenue for an hour each day might finally show uh, what we think of their industrial relations. On health, this person says processes in DHBs are so antiquated. They send notifications of very important specialist appointments by post. By the time the patient receives the letter, the appointment time is passed and the GP has to pick up the mess. On our elephants at Auckland Zoo that are heading off to Australia, this listener says, we're even. Australia gets our elephants, we get their deportees. Another person says, thanks for interviewing Andrew, the elephant team leader. We'll miss the girls. And this one, my husband brought back cash into New Zealand from England on an airplane. I still have the garden table made from her crate. Final word to this person who says, God, you read out some texts from idiots. Oh, should I have read this one? Hmm, I'll do better tomorrow. We'll be back, same place, same time. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The Foreign Minister says New Zealand values its Five Eyes membership, but can decide to take its own course when making declarations about other countries. The Prime Minister says there are mechanisms in place for climate change protesters who feel they have